Hey, White Sox fans, we have left North Carolina. Just left it behind. We've spent time in the Dominican Republic. We spent a lot of time in Arizona. It was about 118 degrees. Uh, Darren did this funny thing where he, he actually cracked an egg on his hood. It cooked. He ate it. I said, don't eat it, Darren. It's cooked off your hood. No, he ate it. He said it was good. Uh, and then, of course, we spent a ton of time in the Carolinas. Um, and But no, we are, we're going we're gonna, to uh, dash off a bit. Uh, West, and we are in Regions Field now. We are going to talk about the Birmingham Barons, the um, uh, ground zero in all ways of the White Sox system, <laughs> given that uh, it is sort of their um, instructs sort of spring training. They're sort of their minor league spring training home away from home. It's where guys go to to report before they go to Arizona when they're drafted. Uh, I think that's even where well, I mean, that's just sort of their home away from home. And that's, I guess, how the region field um, complex is set up to um, foster that. But Project Birmingham is a topic for a future podcast, although I'm sure there'll be some sort of crossover. And I will, you will see or hear me mention the name Project Birmingham, and I will wince and spit, and Darren will laugh at me and make fun of me for that. Uh, but, you know, some of these guys were part of Project Birmingham. Some of them were not. Some of them have blown through Birmingham and now are even in Charlotte. Um, but first, uh, Darren, the rundown on the Birmingham Barons. I did put this out somewhere, I think, in one of the minor league updates. But the uh, Barons before Project Birmingham were a slightly better team than they were with Project Birmingham players, which makes sense because a lot of those guys really shouldn't be in double A in the first place. But again, that's a podcast for the future, and I'll quit previewing it because who knows? Then we'll never do it, and people will be very angry and they will demand their subscription fees back there. And we do not want that. <laughs> Uh, first half for Birmingham, 31 and 38, 10 games behind, 10 games out of first place, seventh best out of eight teams in their uh, league. Uh, second half, 30 and 39, uncannily similar, uh, also 10 games out of first place, and just mirror images. Uh, again, seventh out of eight teams overall. That makes for a total season record of 64 and 77. Uh, Birmingham famously last year, I don't even know why in a previous podcast, I had thought that another team was actually good. Birmingham was playoff bound until their last series last year. And so they still finished. They still were a good team, but they did not make the playoffs. Keeping that streak going, I believe it still is the Great Falls Voyagers as the last affiliate playoff team in the White Sox system. And they are not even in the White Sox system any longer. Darren, help us. Help me, help me, help me. Okay, 20 games back in first place, 64 and 77. Uh, for eighth, that, that's eighth. They were the worst. They were the worst overall in their league, and they were tied for the 35th best out of 40 double-A teams. The, the numbers just are not good, Darren. Negative 52 run differential. Um, not good either. This is just a bunch of not good. So let's desperately claw for something good to talk about in Birmingham. And actually, there are plenty of things good to talk about Birmingham. Let's start off with the weirdest, I would argue, maybe the weirdest story out of Birmingham. Davis Martin, a guy who all along has sort of been like, I don't even know if he's started every single game. Well, no, no guys do that. But I mean, I'm not even sure if they are always, the White Sox are always looking at him only as a starter, although primarily, definitely has primarily been a starter. Guy starts out in Birmingham, does well for a handful of starts, and he's in the major leagues. And he, they, he, he keeps getting called up to the major leagues. He's been back and forth a few times, been on the shuttle, and he seems to, by and large, come through for the major league team. As you pointed out before we started this podcast, he's pitched more for the White Sox than in any field. But we got to talk to him, uh, talk about him in these uh, minors wrap-up podcasts. Let's talk about him in Birmingham. That's where he started, and that's where this crazy odyssey of his uh, began. And it's really actually been sort of a terrific story, particularly because his position, Darren, is starting pitcher, and the White Sox have none of those. Yeah, uh, he... I mean, he's basically the sixth starter at this point, I would say, because um, <clears throat> he is filling in for Michael Kopech at this point. Um, but yeah, he's been, uh, he ended the season pretty well with Birmingham, uh, started there again, and basically was doing the same things with just a lot more strikeouts. Uh, he has, in earlier seasons, been more strikeout heavy earlier, and then kind of uh, wanes, uh, wanes off uh, as the season goes. Um, and you did see that with uh charlotte a little bit by the end uh but now he's obviously back in the majors strikeouts are way down compared to you know double a because 
what he's going up against, you know, the best yeah. bats he's ever seen. Um, so he's not really getting as many, uh, you know, swings and misses on that curveball or slider. Um, but I mean, that fastball, mid nineties fastball looks great. Um, I obviously, I don't think anyone, uh, would be happy if he starts the year in the majors next year. Uh, I think probably if you want to keep him in Charlotte and bring him up and use those options again, like they basically did this year, um, that's the best course of action for him. Um, but yeah, I, this could easily be his ceiling right now. He could easily be a 370, 420 ERA kind of guy, uh, that, only comes up from spot starts uh, or if you're really in a bind for relief pitching comes in and, you know, does his Tanner Banks equivalent. Strap it, strap it down. White Sox fans, a whole different podcast, but there's not going to be any spending this year. There's a pretty good chance. Davis Martin is your number five starter next year. Just listen, strap down, get ready for that. Don't be shocked. If it happens, Darren's shaking his head and, and making fun of me, but that's fine. Uh, listen, one thing you brought up with Davis Martin, uh, maybe even before we talked about him uh, being a major leaguer or whatever, uh, was a, a propensity for the home run ball. What did you see this year? Yeah. From him? Obviously, he's been jumping all over different levels, so it's not fair to, to either uh, condemn or praise him straight out one way or the other. But uh, how is that looking in 2022? It, I mean, it, it was worse in 2022 overall, just if, but if you're just a, you know, White Sox fan that just watches the major league ball team, you wouldn't really think about it because he didn't really allow many homers uh, uh, while pitching with the White Sox, um, at least to this point. Mm-hmm. Um, it's still an issue. I'm sure if he uh, went through a whole season worth of major league innings, it'd be a lot higher. Uh, I The first time he came up, um, you could basically see why it would be an issue. Like he sometimes just leaves a hanging slider up there because he doesn't have great command of it yet. Um, and that's basically where they come from. Um, but if he just, you know, gets better with that, then you, honestly, he would be a fantastic fifth starter if he did uh, keep his uh, breaking pitches down. Like he, but he, he didn't this year overall. Um, so that that would be concerning giving him a spot every fifth day um, at this point but he has improved so quickly uh, since uh, I mean just last year with Winston-Salem with a 530 ERA and now he's got a 370 ERA with with Major League Baseball in 50 innings like 50 innings is definitely a small-ish sample but it's uh, at least like a month and a half, two months worth of innings. So it's yeah, still when, pretty good. And when it should be like a 10 ERA based on what you would have thought and projected for him. Yeah. yeah. I'm going to give him the thumbs up on that one. Hey, a rare happy story for the 2022 Chicago White Sox. Darren, it's wonderful. A little tear to my eye. Let me wipe it. Okay. Uh, yeah. Now let's talk about the number seven starter in the system. And, and again, um, spoiler alert, there's no number eight. Okay. Number seven based on him getting the call up because not only because the Charlotte Knights are so desperate for starters and they're so fatigued with throwing bull, bullpen games every game. Uh, but I think probably just a, a merit uh, start uh, to end the season. Uh, Sean Burke, uh, a guy who is still, this is his first full professional season. He seemed to acquit himself really well and put him in a position to be actually you know, can we can poke fun, but a, a legitimate, you know, in another system, we might be like the number 10 death starter, but in our system, he probably does qualify as number seven. Uh, what do we see that makes, that would get us excited about Sean Burke going forward? Yeah. So it, Davis, Martin, Sean Burke, probably you're going to keep an eye on both of them next year, but Sean Burke's ceiling is definitely higher. Uh, if by the end of the year, it's, you know, uh, more injuries or no signings or anything, and Sean Burke is in there every fifth day, I think people might feel comfortable with that by the end of the year, just based off how he's done in his professional career so far. Um, he was a bigger bonus signing in 2021 out of the third, out of the third round. Uh, started really well at the dash, uh, came up with Birmingham, got off to a slow start, got hurt, uh, was out for a couple weeks, and it took him a while to come back from that injury uh to to form basically um even during his bad streak of seven starts uh where um the R- the ERA was just way too high um the strikeouts he was striking out more uh people per nine um or a, a one batter per nine basically um still fantastic but then <laughs> the way he ended the year uh, was just pretty ridiculous <laughs> a K rate over 40% uh like over 
think you would think, oh, it just, you know, he had a good couple starts. Like, no, it was seven starts <laughs> with a 40% K rate, which is really, obviously really, really good. They were kind of weaning him off uh, innings by the end of it. Right. Of course, that's first professional season. That's yeah. kind of what you do. So he wasn't going five, six. Uh, it was more like three, four, or sometimes five if uh, he got through things pretty clean. Mm -hmm. um, but he uh, pitched over 100 innings this year. So he's on track to still be a starter. He'll probably start in Birmingham next year, and he might have that quick hook like, like a Davis Martin uh, mm -hmm. next year as well, if, if need be. Um, again, ceiling's higher than Davis Martin. He's got a better fastball, faster fastball, better slider, better curve. Um, not sure if he has better command at this point. Um, but again, next year is his second first or second full professional season. So that like that makes sense that Davis Martin picked in, uh, I think 2019 would have better command than a guy picked in 2021. You know what's going to happen, Darren. He's going to end up with like 12 starts for the Sox next year. And then we'll be talking about that. We will be addressing that a year from now, one way or the other, somehow, uh, some way. Okay, there's exciting stuff to talk about in the second half of this podcast. We're going to take a break now and get into that. Of course, we'll talk about some disappointments or weird um, sort of uh, mis miscellany type of uh, guys as well. But there's definitely still a couple of big names to address with the Barons. We'll do that in just a minute. Please hang with us. White Sox fans. Brett Palatini hosting a Birmingham Barons 2022 season review with Darren Black, who provides all the information. I provide a few questions. I nod my head. I uh, threaten uh, Darren, my fellow Libertyville High School Wildcat uh, <laughs> alum, uh, to sing the alma mater. Um, and you see, yeah, we know. I, I don't know what it is, but I figure you, you, you do know, they have one? You're closer to it. Come on, don't they, don't they have to? All right. Well, when we're not proudly wearing the orange and black, orange and black, like come on, what's up with those school. colors? Uh, the orange and black of Liverpool High School. We're talking about the minors for the Southside Sox on the Farm Podcast. I was an elusive podcast this year. I'll admit it. Hey, that's my bad. But uh, we are trying to make up for it a little bit, or I am. Darren's just been waiting. He's been like, hey, come on, bring some pizza and we talk about uh, the system like once a week. <laughs> Where is he? Where'd he go? Well, all right. We didn't do as much this year, but we are trying to make up for it here as in the season, devoting a podcast and uh, a write up from Darren on every one of the players. We're also running a little bit of a st statistical review, if I can say the word, uh, along with Darren's piece as well. So we're giving you a lot of wrap up stuff, probably more than you're interested in, certainly more than the system merits. But hey, that's negative. Let's talk positive. Despite the fact that Darren has traded himself the Oakland A's because he desperately wants a cover system, might have more intriguing prospects in the Chicago White Sox. We are pulling him back. He is not allowed to wear the green and gold or whatever their colors are. We're pulling him back to the White Sox. He is a South Sider. So let's talk a little bit about a couple of prospects for the Birmingham Barons who I dare say have a good chance of seeing time on the actual south side of Chicago in 2023. And who knows the way things are lining up, especially with payroll again, another podcast, uh, the guy who could start next year with the Chicago white Sox. Let's just start out with this guy. He's passed him in height, perhaps justify me or not is Oscar Colas, uh, a guy who seemed to get a tough assignment or at least a tough long stay with Winston Salem and then once he got his first taste of that, you know, bus ticket to the next town, he's like, I'm not stopping. I think the guys, I think the guy wants to make this outside this year. Uh, he is a future games guy. He just, I mean, I think he pretty much ticked every box you could uh, hope for and actually seems to put himself in the picture as a legitimate uh, major league prospect to some degree. So um, hopefully you don't disagree too much with me. Uh, what's the assessment of uh, a Colas and what you saw from 2022? Yeah, um, I, I talked there. It is definitely not out of the realm that he's your makes the makes the team, the White Sox, like out of camp right away next year. Um, I think a big reason why they put him in Winston Salem this year is just to kind of say like, hey, he's not going to make the majors this year. Mm -hmm. I don't think anyone, at least from that I've been doing this, has gone Winston Salem to the majors. Um, I know maybe Garrett, Garrett Crochet kind of is a weird one there, but um, they've done that with pitchers before. I have not right. seen a hitter uh, do that before. Um, so I think that's why he started out in Winston-Salem, and he pretty much did really well right away. He, he has former professional experience. He was older for the dash, probably should have gotten promoted sooner. I know he did uh, have uh, an injury in there that kept him out for a couple of weeks, so maybe that 
is a reason why they kept him there a bit longer than they should have. Um, but once he got to the Barons, he basically did the same things. Um, the power skyrocketed. He still hit over 300, 140 WRC plus, like fantastic numbers. Um, and he's even getting the time in Charlotte, which is, you know, the last couple of weeks is basically an abbreviated AZL experience mm-hmm. uh, for for a guy that probably shouldn't play an extra month for, you know, a, a guy that hasn't played much since 2019. So um, the only things probably needs to work on is the K rate at 24% in double A is kind of, you know, if it goes much higher then that's something to take note of. If it stays right around there, it's completely fine with the power that he's showing. Um, but still, you know, these aren't perfect prospects. It's the White Sox organization. He's not a top hundred guy. So there's there's holes in his game. Uh, he also doesn't walk a ton, um, but with the way that he was swinging the bat when he was making contact, like it makes complete sense if he was trying to just swing at everything and just and he crushed it a bunch. Twenty one homers in his first professional, or sorry, first uh, first year with the White Sox organization. Like he's he's good. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know if he's going to be an all star or a superstar or anything like that, but. The floor seems like it's there and he seems like he could easily be in the right field right now. Yeah. And the need for him to do this at the major league level theoretically won't be there because, because Luis Robert is the guy, but even with Yoki Cespedes playing alongside him for, for a good chunk of the year, it seemed like he was getting a lot of, if not all, a lot of the starts in center field. And I know they sort of threw him there. It was even a surprise that he was sort of beginning there. People I think had him set maybe because of the arm or, or, or what, maybe he just doesn't look like he would be as mobile in center field. I was sort of a surprise to see him starting center field. And then he just sort of never didn't play center field or he certainly still played it very primarily. And part of that seems like, cause he held up okay in center, uh, not necessarily projecting him into the majors that way, but he is a guy who, who has shown he can field that position or that he's got some strength as a fielder that we are not seeing even at the major league level for the white Sox right now. Correct. Uh, well, I mean, definitely. Yeah. He has an <laughs> That's a low bar. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, he may, mainly played center in, with the dash. Um, and I'm totally okay with that. Again, if you're uh, kind of a tweener shortstop second baseman, I say, you know, unless Colson Montgomery or Jose Rodriguez is there, uh, put him at shortstop, just let him prove that right. he can't do it. Right. Same thing with center. Yeah. Let him prove that he's not fast enough or has uh, not great enough uh, 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 hit off the bat skills mm-hmm. uh, to kind of read that. Um, but he did mainly play right. Uh, when he got got to double a mostly because Yoki Cespedes is you know an actual like really good fielder um, the bat is kind of you don't know um, but um, Yoki said if we're talking about ceilings Oscar Colas is, is far higher than mm-hmm. Cespedes is um, one thing you bring out in your um, review and in discussing uh, Colas is sort of things to uh, intimate things to look for in um, year two, which again, really sort of isn't a true year two for him because he's been a pro um, for years before this, he's played in now uh, three countries. Um, but what are the, what are the types of things you need to see him um, clean up or improve again, even if that means he breaks camp with the White Sox, that, that speaks more to the White Sox <laughs> failure in the off season or limited payroll than it might um, what he did in spring training, because no matter what, it's still just spring training. Uh, what are things you're going to need to see at whatever level he's starting? Let's presume it's Charlotte, but whatever level he's, he's starting, um, they're going to make you feel like, uh, wow, progress. You know, he's he's not going to he's not going to fall back. This guy's going to continue um, to strive forward until he really is a regular major leaguer. Yeah. So it, if he has uh, like p- play discipline numbers closer to what he had with the dash uh, in presumably Charlotte, but well, some people might say most likely the majors, but presumably Charlotte at this point. Um, if he has it closer to the dash numbers where it's an 8% walk rate, which is fine. Um, with the p- kind of power he has, you do kind of want him swinging the bat uh, more often to show that power. But the K rate that is right at 20% low 20s instead of uh, that 4% rise to double A. Um, it, it is, it will be a good barometer just to see where he's at in Charlotte right now, if it does keep rising a bit. Um, but just keeping it, you know, low twenties, maybe low mid twenties, uh, strikeout rate, um, is kind of what you want, you want to see. Um, cause the bat to ball skills are there. Like when he, when the pat makes contact with whatever pitch it's, he's driving it 
whether it's to the gaps or just over everything and flies sometimes. over scoreboards. Yep. Yeah. Um, like he's just a really impressive hitter. Um, you just gotta see that patience more professional at bats. Um, we talk about that with Colson Montgomery all the time. Like maybe he's not hitting well, but he's still just working the count, um, trying to get on base any, 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 anyhow. Um, and that's mm-hmm. something that Colas just needs to, just needs to work on, but that might just not be the player he is. Mm-hmm. And, and if it's not, then cut down on the strikeouts, uh, and just, you know, more bet on the ball will probably mean more balls go far for him. You can say this cynically, you can say it excitedly, or it can be a little bit of both. I'm going to say it cynically because that's my role here, I guess, a lot of the time. When you guys make me get positive and rah-rah, you know the tone is really that. That could be readers, that can be staff members. When I'm starting to be the rah-rah guy, you know things have gotten way too much death, Paul. But I will say it cynically, yes, count me as one of those people who thinks he will be in the major leagues to begin next year because I just don't see the White Sox solving any issues. And he just sort of created a solution for them that's going to allow them to go, hey, man, you don't expect us to pay for guy or trade for guy when we got Oscar Colas in the minors. All right, let's talk about another very exciting prospect. And Darren, listen, I don't want to make this all about me, but let's make it all about me. Uh, We have not usually, I don't think, done mid-season prospect picks. And um, Trooper did his big thing, like a 4,000-word piece on, you know, where his check-in on guys, which is awesome. Uh, And then, you know, I pressured other people like you and Joe and and myself to uh, do a little top 10 or 11 or 12 or 13. And listen, I got to admit, I feel pretty good about my picks every year. Uh, but midseason, I think I really, I don't know how to do them. I think I failed. I think I um, got too excited about guys who gave me a good half season. I got too down on guys who weren't giving me a, a good half season. Now, you don't have to say, you don't have to comfort me here. You can call me an idiot. It's fine. That, that's absolutely <laughs> fine. But, you know, I really thought what Jose Rodriguez did in his first half, it really took the, and I Love the guy. We've been we've been tracking him since Arizona, you know, certainly because he's he really demanded to be on the radar from Arizona mm-hmm. on. Incredible year last year, which just seemed like nothing could stop him, and he could be in the majors this year. Uh, and that first half, it was sort of gutting because you know the defense wasn't exactly wasn't I don't think it's bad, but it wasn't not like he learned how to do that overnight. Uh, and a lot of I mean, there seemed to be greater holes in the game, including not being able to hit the ball like Harley out of the infield. Um, well, he corrected that. <clears throat> Apparently he read my, my bad ranking and he got really ticked off and man, did he put himself, I mean, not that he should have ever been taken away. Listen, I admit my fault. I'm an idiot, but, uh, he's, he's, he's right back there. He's a guy that we could easily see in the majors at some point, um, next year, or certainly playing at Charlotte and not necessarily, especially in Charlotte, maybe really finding that power stroke. Um, uh, all that blather aside, um, you know, just give me a little idea of that roller coaster season he had because uh, wow, it was a weird one, not one we expected. Yeah, uh, yeah. Um, he came out of last year as the top Sox prospect, um, in in my view, and I still had him, I believe, second or third in that midseason. So I ah, didn't see, I didn't drop him too much. Um, but um, no matter what, after Colson Montgomery's season, he was always going to be at least number two. Mm-hmm. Um, but basically what happened with Rodriguez is he was legitimately bad for the first 40 games of the season. Um, you saw just one homer in 41 games, uh, but the batting average was also low. Um, he's still, I mean, he's, he's not a guy that walks a ton, um, but the strikeouts were still kind of there. He's just getting outs uh, and not making great contact overall. Um, and then he basically just steadily improved one aspect, um, like the next half of the season over the next 38 games, he had a 331 batting average, which is fantastic. Uh, but he had no homers. So he, he wasn't, he was barely above an average WRC plus it was at 108. Um, you, you would think a guy with a 330 average would, you know, <laughs> like 180 WRC right. plus, but no, he doesn't walk much. Um, is not much power. Um, just all the strikeouts that he was having in the first 40 ish games, uh, were basically becoming hits at that point. Then tick off the final 25 games. Now he ended the season with 11 homers. I haven't mentioned one homer right now. So in the last, <laughs> last 25 games, he, he was hit pissed. 10 homers. <laughs> Everything came together uh, by the end of the year. And um, I was wondering as his batting average was going up during those uh, 38 games, like, is he going to get to 
an average season in double a and then boom he had us he hit a homer in five straight games um talking about colson montgomery getting on base for two months uh homer in five straight games for jose rodriguez um he was just hitting the crap out of the ball the average fell but um the walks actually skyrocketed up to 15 percent, which is fantastic and the k's didn't go up that much during his power surge they were still in the mid teens which is I mean, you're hitting 10 homers in 25 games and only striking out like 16% of the time. That's fantastic. Um, so, yeah, he should definitely start in Charlotte next year. Um, I Like, I know he's not going to go through another 25-game stretch of 10 homers. That's <laughs> not the kind of guy he is. But if he kind of combines the that middle 38 with the last 25, like has 300 batting average, uh, the same 170 ISO that he had last year that made us so excited for him, then then you're kind of looking at hey like if i guess if we're going based off of the same oscar colas stuff um <laughs> then looking at second base and saying like hey lenin sosa isn't getting it done or yolbert sanchez isn't getting it done uh if we're just going to use the prospects mm-hmm. <laughs> in, in the holes um then you're looking at jose rodriguez as a guy that has more potential than all those guys mm-hmm. uh as a potential option and um i do want to mention that this is the first season that he played more uh or well not not more second than shortstop but it was basically even this year and he was playing significantly more shortstop in other places some of that is Lenin Sosa needed to play short uh and Jose or Gilbert Sanchez to begin the year um but they did make a conscious effort to get him time at second um so if if he's going to come up while Tim Anderson's still here then that's where he would go and uh, I don't know, I, there are guys who've been sort of turning the ballpark tendencies on their ear a little bit. And then we've got the weird juice ball, pinball, wiffle ball, no, you know, 16 inch softball. So, you know, who, who knows what any of this means anymore? But I mean, traditionally, at least the move to Charlotte could, could really put a charge in some of it. You know, you know, these singles become gappers, gappers maybe go over the wall. I mean, he, he, I mean, he really, he's a guy who could hit the ground running next year and put himself on the map for the White Sox you know, early, not to put that pressure on him, you know, he gets angry under that pressure, but uh, I mean, Mm -hmm. you know, this is a guy who could, you know, sort of, sort of do some vaulting, which is sort of what we thought he might do this year and it didn't happen. So then suddenly idiots like me are like, Oh, well, God, forget to take him off to completely off my, my, my top list. Uh, Okay. Well, I'm dumb and you didn't do that, but um, you know, but still uh, you have to admit the way he started is like, "Uh Oh, what's, you know, what's going on here. Don't tell me the guy hit the wall in, um, you know, in double a geez. Um, But it's good. You know, if not for that little injury, who knows how he would end up this season might have been even more impressive than what he turned his season into. And that's that's a real tribute to him. That's really uh, that's digging deep. He's shown he's got a little bit more fight than a number of our major leaguers. Okay, let's talk about a couple guys um, before we run out of time. Let's talk about a couple of guys who may have disappointed. Let's go back to some arms. Caitlin Freeman had been hyped, I think, as of two years ago, as perhaps the arm to look at out of the bullpen in the system. Uh, I'm not sure he could be considered that now. Uh, Jason Blouse, a guy who I don't, they're not really sure how to use, and um, I think he maybe justified some of that uncertainty because he really didn't put too much um, together real well this year. Those are two guys mm-hmm. who are tr- maybe treading water at best with this 2022 season. Yeah, yeah. Um, Caleb Freeman started the year hurt um, and only appeared in 18 games, and when he came back, walks were a huge issue. Um, and he just, he never got it going. Um, I, he, he probably is the most interesting uh, or best relief prospect still. Mm. Um, the, the White Sox used to have a ton of them right now. They're kind of using uh, starting pitchers that don't really work out uh, <laughs> as bullpenners right now um, or that are hurt and they put them in the bullpen. Um but really, other than Caleb Freeman, um, I mean, you guys have he- guys here and there that have had decent seasons, but it's more, you know, prove it to me next year again if you're good. Um, and But Freeman still has that potential to uh, kind of be that middle re- middle relief, uh, potentially even back end of the bullpen kind of guy. Um, he just has to put it together next season, like show better command. And maybe it all just comes down to having a healthy offseason and a healthy beginning of the season. Um, but yeah, last year or this year was really, you know, disappointing for him, even if it was injury riddled, 
uh, he didn't really show the stuff that you wanted to see. Because uh, Romy Gonzalez, you know, injury world season showed what you wanted to see by the end of it. Right. Um, but yeah, Jason, Jason B. Um, <laughs> I have been saying I want him to be a reliever for a really long yeah, time. Because yeah. um, I didn't really see him being a fantastic uh, uh, starter just because he doesn't really have a third pitch. Um, and that kind of third pitch is a changeup. And if you don't have a decent changeup as a starter, then what are you doing? So if he just works off that fastball slider combo, um, I think he could be a decent reliever. Um, and maybe not comparable to Jimmy Lambert. I think Jimmy Lambert throws harder, but also he was basically a reliever. So you would mm-hmm. assume that he's you know going to throw harder than a than a starter at this mm-hmm. point. Um, but yeah, he he was. I mean, he was really bad this year, Jason P. As a starter, um, I'm not sure what they're going to do going forward, um, but I think a move to the bullpen would be best. Um, even though you know Charlotte doesn't have a ton of starting pitchers, mm-hmm. I think you just kind of got to make the move uh, as the best thing for his development. Are both of these guys uh, starting the year in the Charlotte bullpen next year? Um, Caleb Freeman might be. A bit different i could see him starting in double a just okay. because i they seem to have uh more concentration of player development there mm-hmm. um and justin Drishelli, the basically m- managing prospect uh <laughs> that they have um he's also coaching the azl team or managing the azl team um is there uh maybe you just kind of keep him there just to see how he does and if he does well in the first month then you bring him up uh Jason B, yeah, he, he'll be in Charlotte, um, just hopefully in the pen. Yeah. Um, but that's all dependent on um, whether they bring in, you know, older starters to pull out that bull, that rotation next year or if they feel comfortable bringing up a guy like Tommy Summer who ended the year in double-A mm. uh, to get some Charlotte innings. Um, just kind of have to wait and see how the, I don't know, like, 300 roster spots an organization has um, to <laughs> yeah. fill out falls. It's um, tricky. We, we already held sort of a draft before we started this podcast aside who we we're going to talk about for Birmingham podcast and Charlotte. So I don't want to get to the Charlotte guys, but I also don't want to skip over anybody in Birmingham that you feel is important to talk about. I actually thought we'd have a lot more time to talk about miscellaneous guys. And look at this, man, we are, we were up against it and uh, you know, we've only talked about a handful of guys, but uh, anybody we're missing at Birmingham, you know, to watch or guys that the organization's ready to give up on or whatever. Um, so I, I forgot about him in my review. Now that uh, we kind of <laughs> talked about it a bit, Yolki Cespedes, um, I'll have to add something about him um, just because there was a whole concentration everywhere else. Um, yeah. And he didn't have a fantastic season, no real improvement from last year. Um, but I mean, I guess he did show more power, uh, but the, he's now striking out 30% of the time in double a, um, the walk rate didn't go up as much as you wanted, uh, just under 6%, um, a 350 bad, but still a 258 batting average. That's pretty concerning. Um, but he is pretty, you know, good defensively in center if, and he can move around if he needs to be left or right. Uh, he, he can do that. He, at this point, I'm probably looking at him as a fourth outfielder. Um, maybe just a well, I, I guess Adam Engel did have decent spurts as a as a hitter. Um, Cespedes is definitely not the uh, outfielder he is. Engel is, um, but if you're looking for a guy that's going to platoon against lefties, I think Yolki is going to end up being that guy. He's much better against lefties than righties. Shows much more power against lefties, lefties and righties, and it, it, it's considerable. Like, he's a right-handed hitter. You would just assume, like, obviously he's going to be better against lefties, but it's, you know, a pretty big gap mm-hmm. between between what he'd show and OPS-wise. So he could easily be in the White Sox next year. I don't think he's going to break camp. He'll probably start in Charlotte. Um, and if he does well and they, you know, whatever fourth outfielder or – second outfielder or third outfielder however many not enough outfielders they have <laughs> um, really well. uh gets hurt or one yeah. guy's just not doing really well then come up then he's up platooning against lefties and i think he's a that'd be a great spot for him yeah and to caution you know getting too carried away i mean for bad or good oftentimes it's bad but uh, or adam engel is a you know he's, he's a he's an arizona mvp every year 
uh, when he's healthy. Uh, you know, uh, Yoki had um, a, a really strong spring, and you'd have thought, I mean, not that he was going to break camp with the team, but you thought, oh, wow, this, you know, this guy showed in a way against, you know, oftentimes at least spot major league competition that he can hold his own, and then he, you know, he gets to Birmingham and you know, just doesn't do very well, as you said, sort of an underwhelming some season. people up and they ate him up. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I mean, you can't get too carried away one way or the other with uh, Cactus League stats, although the stories can sometimes be nice, and sometimes guys do just burn it up and stick and never look back. So White Sox are definitely counting at least one or two of those guys uh, in the spring because they certainly will not have um, spent to fortify the roster. But, again, that's a different podcast. Who knows? Maybe we'll, maybe we'll get that in the offseason. Well, we still got at least – one more of these reviews to do Darren. I don't know. I have no idea what we're going to possibly talk about. Okay. I guess we know at least a couple guys are obvious, but that Charlotte Knights one is going to be fun. I'm looking forward to it. I cannot Ooh. wait until tomorrow when we get to that. And I'm sure all of you listening and reading can't either Charlotte Knights coming up to wind up our uh, postseason wrap up series on Southside Sox on the front podcast, Darren. Uh, thanks a lot. Okay, go study the Wildcats um the theme song because you know you 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 might be you might be challenged on it you might have to name that tune um and yes uh prepare your uh, wardrobe changes for next podcast uh i'll catch you um talking to uh, charlotte tomorrow fantastic time (laughs) i'm sure (laughs) it'll be great oh man i want to do it right now we're gonna we're gonna just record right now we are both so fired up all right thanks everybody for listening (laughs)